Welcome to Uncorrelated Investing, a new Opalesque news program that focuses on investments that are not necessarily hinged to the economy or the stock market at large. My name is Mark Malin. I'm your host for what's going to be a very important program at this moment in economic history. Not only are we in the middle of an MF global crisis that is literally bringing this industry to its breaking point, but we're also at a moment in economic history where the debt crisis could provide stock investors difficulty for not just years to come, not just decades to come, but potentially a generation. So right now, the moment for uncorrelated investing is at hand, and I hope you find this program useful. Our first story is a fascinating interview with Mark Shore, adjunct professor of managed futures at DePaul University. Then we get right into the hot topic of the MF global situation, focusing on what is essentially the untold larger picture behind the story and tackling issues that are currently testing the strength of the futures and options industry backbone. We're going to take a look at regulatory protections. So let's get started right away by watching the interview with Mark Shore. And I want you to keep an eye out for the key point where Mark and I start to laugh. Because while we're laughing, once you understand what we're laughing at, that's the key to understanding uncorrelated investments. Mark has a distinguished career. He started as a CTA in-house for Morgan Stanley, worked there for nine years, then went to risk management at Octane Research. Uh, Mark brings a lot of experience to this industry and uh, his course in Managed Futures is well received. Mark, why don't you talk to me about some of the myths that you see in Managed Futures and some of the black box strategies that are now starting to become a little more open and a little more understood by investors. Yeah, number one is that historically there's always been this view that the CTAs were not going to open up their strategies, that it, you know they wouldn't talk about it. However, a lot of them actually will talk about it. They may not tell you the actual parameter settings, but they can tell you a lot as to what they're doing. Talk to me about some of what you're seeing in the managed futures industry today. Well, what I'm seeing is definitely a huge growth. The assets under management, even from a year ago where it was sitting at around $260 billion, it's now at about $320 billion. If you look at managed futures as a strategy, along with all the other hedge fund strategies, there's more assets within managed futures than there is in the other strategies. However, what I'm really seeing is people are opening up to it. Investors are opening up. They're asking questions. The institutions are asking questions. Um, you, you've got the investment consultants who are now really starting to ask about it and try to understand it and to work with their with their clients about it. So there, there's a huge mindset change that's happened in the last few years. Still, even in 2008, hedge funds didn't help all that much. Real estate obviously didn't help. So I need to do something more. I need to, to diversify the asset allocation more. What else can I do? And they start asking questions about managed futures. So education is number one. Once they start to understand that, then they start going to the next step and saying, okay, now let's look at the managers and what do we need to do and you know what fits with our portfolio and our risk tolerance or what if we have a if the manager or, or the investor has a particular mandate doesn't meet that mandate. Talk to me about tail risk, because that's a big issue. Well, with tail risk, what you have is with CTAs where they can be an added value into a portfolio. 2008, 2009 are a great example of that, where you had a lot of portfolios heavily weighted into equities. They, there was a lot of negative returns they were seeing. Well, they, they didn't realize the amount of neg negativeness, negative skewness they could have in their returns. Um, what what managed futures would do is help to smooth out those returns. So it, would, it could potentially bring their negative returns in a little bit. Well, 
Well, one of the questions that always comes up is, why is it non-correlated to equities? How can, how can that be? That's a great question. Yeah, and, and so that really kind of starts getting into the whole situation about, okay, well, what is managed futures? How do they trade their portfolio? And I always say, you know, that it's often a very dynamic, a very fluid portfolio. They can be trading anywhere from one market to 100 different markets. They can be long, they can be short in any of those markets at any given time. They could be flat. They could be using other futures contracts to spread. They could be using options. It could be purely an option strategy. I mean, there's a lot of different routes that can go, and they can be you know, trading in multiple sectors. Talk to me about market environments, because you just hit on something very interesting there. Well, with market environments, I mean, that comes back to when you're looking at a strategy. What sort of environments does it work well in? When does it not work well? Um, you want to understand that, because it, no strategy is going to work well all the time. So the idea of, of it is, when will it work? And, and, and for the investor to understand that, and then to say, okay, well, how does that fit into the portfolio? Because you may have um, one CTA that has a strategy that maybe in a more volatile environment works really well. Someone else, that when it's things are a little bit more solid, um, when it's more trend following, it, it works better. Um, it, it depends, but you can say that, you can look at that and say, okay, how does that work in the portfolio? And maybe you give allocation to a number of different CTAs that are trading different styles, and you, in essence, you know, you're creating this allocation of, of uh, like a fund of funds, right. organically creating that. Diversified portfolio. Mark, this is an absolutely beautiful facility here in uh, the Chicago Loop. Looks like a trading room that you'd find in a hedge fund. Tell me uh, a little about it. Yeah, DePaul opened this in, um, I think, in 2008, and the idea was to create, uh, to simulate an actual trading room for the students and also make it more tech savvy. So it's not just about, well, okay, you know, I can do Excel, but you know, being able to use Bloomberg and other things. And this classroom, I believe, is used for financial engineering courses, uh, some investment courses, things along those lines. Excellent. Mark, thanks much for your time. It's been very informative. Thank you. So now that we've introduced you to uncorrelated investments and managed futures at a very basic level, it's time to take a step back. We're going to tackle a hot industry topic, the MF Global Saga. And to do so, I want to take a look all the way back to 1998 to put the situation into perspective. 1998 was a point in time when John Corzine was president of Goldman Sachs, which is essentially to say he was on top of the financial world. This was also a period of time when Brooksley Bourne ran the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC. Ms. Bourne was widely respected in the commodity industry. Having been a successful lawyer, she understood how derivatives were typically managed. And she recognized they were essentially traded on a regulated exchange and the leverage was transparent. And here's the key point. When leverage is utilized, that leverage is best managed when it's transparent and the contents of what is being traded is known to all participants. That seems like a pretty basic principle, right? But Brooksley Bourne ran into a problem with it. According to published reports, this common sense method of managing leverage was opposed by powerful forces who were packaging and selling non-transparent mortgage derivative products traded off exchange. In her work at the CFTC, Ms. Bourne's mandate was simple, regulate derivatives and prevent fraud. In this role, she discovered those non-transparent mortgage derivatives traded and sold by Mr. Corzine and others. She looked at the scope of the situation and publicly determined the undisclosed leverage had the potential to implode and negatively impact the economy. She then fought to bring transparency to the toxic mortgage derivatives. Well, long story short, her efforts to bring this transparency were at odds with Mr. Corzine's financial engineering. So on the one side, we had Mr. Corzine and his interests, and on the other side, we had Brooksley Bourne and the interests of transparency. 
what do you think happened? I'll give you a hint. The concept of transparency doesn't have billions of dollars in lobbying money to spread around. It doesn't take a mathematical genius to figure out the angles on this story. In a battle that pitted the financial services lobby against a regulator, those being regulated were able to top the government regulator. Ms. Bourne was stripped from her powers and eventually forced from office in 1999. So what does this matter? We all know what happened to the mortgage derivatives when they exploded on the economy in 2008. Well, the point is no one should really be surprised at what's going on with MF Global if you understand the pattern of behavior in the history. So what does it mean and where does that put us now? There have been a number of good articles written on this Corzine episode. I wrote an article on the website that detailed the whole Brooksley Bourne incident, and it also links to a very good PBS documentary on the topic that really got in the inside of what occurred. One of the articles that I find interesting is this Newsweek article uh, dated December 12th, and it presents a reasonably balanced view of the situation. Um, I mean, you have to recognize that Mr. Corzine did take over a company uh, that was in financial distress with interest rates near zero that reduces a futures commission merchant's revenues significantly. I'm going to explain that in the next segment when we talk about account segregation. Um, the article here noticed that uh, Mr. Corzine just didn't believe the rules of risk applied to him. And uh, then here on page 50, it discusses uh, this MF Global lobbying letter. And I believe in the future this lobbying letter is going to become a reasonably important point in the discussion because right now, as of this recording, it appears as though uh, Mr. Corzine is looking for a fall person. And I say person because it may be a woman who's the fall person. We'll see. It's going to be interesting to see what occurs here. But let's take a look at the MF Global lobbying letter from the perspective of understanding how account segregation works and get into the heart of the key issue. On screen, you see the MF Global lobbying letter. I'm not going to get into all the details here because I wrote an article about it published December 2nd. You can click on the link on the screen to read that article. Here's the key point for discussion because it leads to the concept of account segregation and investor protections. MF Global was requesting that the CFTC back off restrictions in how the FCM could invest segregated funds. There are a number of ironic aspects to this letter, but one of them is that the letter acknowledges that essentially the CFTC communicated to MF Global the practice of utilizing segregated funds in sovereign debt was not considered common and that the CFTC also provided a warning regarding the safety of sovereign debt investments. What I find to be the most interesting aspect of this MF Global saga and its focus on customer segregated funds, here's the bottom line. It could have all been prevented if customers knew how to take control of the process. Right now there's talk that regulations need to be changed and there need to be different processes in order to limit an FCM's investment in customer segregated funds. But here's the secret that has always been known inside the industry and a number of FCM's that I know are not going to be happy with this disclosure. But the bottom line is an investor can control those segregated fund investments and the investor can determine where the investment is placed and the investor can gain the interest income on those segregated funds. That's the big secret that needs to be disclosed. Now, many professional investors have known this. And when talking to professional investors, we typically advise that their segregated fund investment and their margin deposit is managed by the investor, not by the FCM. In our next issue of Opalesque Futures Strategies, I'm going to be giving five specific methods to accomplish this. And then in the next issue of Opalesque Uncorrelated Investing TV, I'm going to be detailing the account segregation process 
at a high level. But for now, let's consider John Corzine and the MF Global situation from a different perspective. When understanding the responsibility of a regulator and the associated segregated funds protection, it can be instructive to consider how the concept of police protection works. The police are not standing on every street corner watching the movement of every citizen. When a crime occurs, the police respond, gather information, and work to solve the crime. Sometimes the crime is solved, sometimes it's not solved. Futures and options industry regulation isn't that dissimilar. Regulators audit members on a regular basis and enforce business processes. For instance, CTAs are subject to performance audits, but they also have to have business processes in place about how they manage money, about what they do if a key man were to fall down, about what they were to do in case of a disaster recovery. There are significant business processes that the NFA in particular requires that CTAs and CPOs have in place for investor protections. So in the case of this MF Global situation, the reason I think that the industry is working as it should be is a potential fraud has been committed and the industry has been brought to its brink, to its, right at its breaking point. But What's happening is the regulators are going in, they're reviewing the paper trail. They're looking at the business processes, and ultimately, in my opinion, justice will be served. I don't know if Mr. Corzine is guilty, or I don't know if he's innocent. I don't think I have the information. I know I don't have all the information. I only have one piece of information from one perspective. I think what the judge will do is analyze the entire picture, which I don't really think any of us have at this point. This spotless track record is currently being tested. And the industry backbone is literally being brought to the brink. Now, no one wants to see a man beaten down. You know, within Goldman, Mr. Corzine was known as Fuzzy, and he was often said to give people the peace sign as he walked through the halls. So clearly, he's a colorful individual. But he's also a man that came into this industry and one might consider that he didn't really pay much attention to the operations of this industry and its key components. With regards to Mr. Corzine, if it is discovered that he committed fraud or willfully knew a violation of segregated fund rules, punishment should be swift, just, and send a message that the sanctity of an industry cannot be put in jeopardy. I'm Mark Malin. This has been Uncorrelated Investing. I hope you'll stay with us for some of our upcoming issues. I'll provide a preview now. In our next issue, I talk with Michael Covell, author of the Trend Following series of books and who also directed the movie Broke. And for those of you that know Michael, you know it was an interesting conversation. 100% I mean, trend following. I mean, really through the turtles initially, and then broadening out to many other traders in the trend following space. A lot of the names that we all know, the, the Dunn Capitals, the John Henrys, the old standards, and a lot of the new guys too, the Salem Abrahams, the David Hardings. That's funny, you called David Harding a new guy. <laughs> well, he, he, might, he might hate to say it that way, because if you look back, he's been around in this industry for 25 plus years, right. but I guess new in terms of getting the notoriety and doing very well in the last five or six years. Michael and I had a lot to talk about, and actually, that interview could have gone on for hours. Next, I take a look at a trend following CTA. And what I like to talk about with CTAs is risk management and algorithms. People want to know how things work and what market environments they should be working in and importantly, what market environments might they experience a degree of risk. The other day I received a copy of the book Ponzimonium in the mail and uh, looks like an interesting book. I'm going to be reviewing it in the upcoming issue of Opalesque OFI. Here's the book Ponzimonium, 
written by Bart Chilton, who is a commissioner at the CFTC. And uh, the book appears to have some interesting information. Here's an investor checklist that's always good. Um, and what I like, I actually marked it here, is the Investor Bill of Rights. That's interesting. And uh, the book essentially details a number of the different uh, Ponzi scams and, and what took place and helps investors to understand how they can protect themselves. Um, interesting, uh, CNBC, uh, Lori Speckler had sent this to me and Bart signed it. He says to her, let's work to educate folks about the fraudsters and stop the Ponzimonium. Um, good cause and I think if you're an investor you do not want to get caught in a Ponzi scheme and this is a good book that uh, I will be reviewing in the next issue of Opalesque Futures Intelligence. We have two publications. The first publication is Opalesque Futures Intelligence. Opalesque Futures Intelligence addresses the industry at a high level. It's going to talk about the personalities in the industry, who's doing what, the regulation, much of the news, and much of the high-level details. Then we have a second publication that's really more tactical. It's called Opalesque Futures Strategies. Opalesque Futures Strategies provides professional investors recommendations and advice on how to invest in uncorrelated investments and manage futures takes specific looks at market environment, talks in depth with the CTA managers regarding their performance and how they manage risk. So these two publications are interesting and we're going to be reviewing a number of different items.